in some ways, this is, this is uh, an important distinction. In some ways, it really isn't, um, because most BDD is much like other BDD. Um, but we've had a particular interest this year in uh, muscle dysmorphia. Um, so we thought we ought to talk a little bit about that. Um, and we also thought it might be therefore relevant to talk about other kinds of areas of concern that are relevant uh, particularly to men. Um, although I notice we have a number of women in the audience. <laughs> um, is that because you know men with BDD or is it you're curious? Or? Uh, fair enough. Um, so I'm going to talk somewhat about um, the principles of treatment, um, but I'm not going to get into the kind of too much of the into the nitty gritty of that today. Um, I want to try and, in some ways, keep it more in the spirit of how you might try and overcome uh, various kinds of BDD. Um, because I think one of the worst questions I get asked as a therapist is to provide um, a sort of step-by-step -step program uh, for someone to overcome BDD. But if you don't, if you don't really get the kind of to the, to the core of it, if you don't kind of get behind how to overcome BDD, if you don't really, in, in, in some ways, embrace it yourself, um, we can give programs and guides and so on, but it isn't necessarily going to fit very well. It isn't going to sit as if it's something you can really use to transform and, and overcome your BDD. So I'm going, to be try, I'm going to try and kind of keep it in that spirit. So, you know, it's a common misconception that body dysmorphic disorder is a problem that mostly affects women, and it really isn't. It's fractionally more common in women. It may be, of course, that that's, uh, that figure is slightly pulled because men are idiots. We don't like to talk to people about our problems. We go to other things. Um, you know, we'll drink and fight and do other kinds of really stupid things. So, <laughs> um, so it may be that that's slightly underreported, but it, it's it's very close anyway. And BDD is BDD. It's um, whether it's a man or a woman, it's going to be about criticising about your appearance too much, worrying excessively, spending a lot of time thinking about your appearance. Uh, the cut-off point is important that it's, you know, if you want to know whether you've got BDD or not, one of the really important things to look for is whether you're spending more than an hour a day worrying about your appearance, um, whether you're spending time checking or fixing your appearance in some ways, covering it up, concealing it. Paul, I really, was really pleased to hear Paul mention comparing is such an important process in, in shame and self-esteem. It's a hugely important process in BDD. Um, avoidance, of course, for anything that's related to threat, is, and we tend to try and avoid threats. It's a way of keeping ourselves safe. Lots of critical thoughts that cause anxiety and shame. And the other thing that delineates body dysmorphic disorder from everyday appearance concerns is that the level of distress and the level of preoccupation substantially interferes in your life in some way. And this is, this is particularly important when you're considering the difference between, say, people who work out in the gym and are interested in keeping themselves fit and trim without BDD and those people who do have BDD. You know, it's not about whether you have an interest in your appearance. Having an interest in your appearance is fine. Having an interest in your appearance that dominates your thinking, ruins your life, and causes you great distress is not so fine. Um, and that's hopefully what we'll talk a bit more about today. It, it, in, in a few interviews I've been giving, I've been involved in lately around um, men's uh, body dysmorphic disorder type of concerns. One of the things that keeps coming up is, is it, again, is it caused by the media? Is it caused by social media? The answer really is no, but it might be a bit. And one of the things that's of interest to me is that maybe men are going through an interesting time in the sense that women's magazines with um, pictures about how to look after your appearance have been around for a very long time. Men's magazines that have pictures of women in them have been around for a very long time. Men's magazines with images of men on them are, have been around for substantially less amount of time. 
And it may be that there's been an interesting cultural shift towards um, a focus upon appearance, and partic maybe particular kinds of aspects of appearance, such as being more muscular, having a six pack, um, these kinds of things. Uh, and I've forgotten I put that Donald Trump on him. Um, bless his heart. Um, and I was, so I was beginning to think, well, what, what other kinds of things are changing for men, maybe, that are, are perhaps going to increase dissatisfaction in appearance? And certainly dissatisfaction in appearance is an important contribution in developing BDD. So one of the other interesting, this was actually, this, someone sent me a tweet of, uh, a little while ago with this image in, and I think it's a really striking image. Um, Batman back when I was a boy, um, compared to now, um, is a much more ordinary looking fella. But today's Batman figure is considerably more muscled, a bit meaner looking as well, I think. Um, but there's, a, there's a obviously much greater difference in, in body image. And the idea that this is now the image on the, on the right-hand side here, the idea that this is going to be the image that we're asking our young men to aspire to is clearly going to put, on, on, under, put these guys under an excessive and unnecessary amount of pressure to be overly muscled and lean and so on. But I'm curious at whether anybody else here has any other thoughts on what kinds of pressures might be going on socially that may be contributing to uh, men developing concerns about their appearance. So I think that's interesting in the sense of almost people almost living like a, a celebrity lifestyle. So not only do people feel like they've got to be able to tell everybody about their interesting and uh, windswept lives, but they're also doing their own personal edits on, their, on the images that, that people see, as if they're putting together a column, a feature. So it means that the images that we might compare ourselves against are going to be, again, more biased, more refined. Tinder dating. Do you want to say a little bit more about that? More, slightly more superficial, much more expectation and focus upon image and appearance. Um, but there's now a huge proliferation of men's grooming products, from, from beard to hair to eyes to refining the pores on your skin. And the implication, of course, is then if you're not using these products, you're kind of maybe not trying hard enough. Male identity. Could you say a bit more about that? But there, and it's an interesting thing because, because uh, the role of a, of a bloke, of a man, has changed. And there is a kind of question about well, what, what are men about now? What is our identity? And, the, and if these kinds of images are the suggestion of what our identity should be about, we're clearly putting things in a really twisted direction. Right. So uh, the access and the availability of things to improve and enhance our physique is also growing. It, 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 there's been an exponential rise in the use of steroids. No, but there, there, again, there is a, uh, the, the, it, it, it cycles back, doesn't it? There's an increased pressure on people in the public eye to look well-groomed and well-polished and getting their teeth whitened and all that stuff. Uh, so the, the pressure uh, becomes on us more, us ordinary folk. What about, dare I mention, the thing that I think Paul Gilbert was alluding to in EastEnders, which I'm not entirely sure he meant EastEnders when he was talking about erotic, stimulating materials. Because, of course, <clears throat> back in my day, if you, if, if you wanted a certain sort of stimulation, you'd have to obtain, usually through your mate, a, a certain kind of gentleman's magazine. Um, but these days, of course, we have the internet. And you know, there are plenty of people that suggest that the, probably the internet wouldn't exist in the way it does if it weren't for internet porn. So, of course, the important thing here is the access, therefore, to images that one can compare against in, in certainly both the naked bodies and, of course, genitals, is, is dramatically different now than it used to be. So we're in it, we have interesting times. And it might be, therefore, in, if you put this together with Paul's comments about us having quite a tricky brain, a, a, a threat-biased brain, we may actually have to work quite hard now to keep our thinking straight and our heads on properly about our appearance. Because we're not getting a lot of help. So uh, typically, um, <laughs> men are 
unsurprisingly slightly more likely to be concerned with their genitals. Um, they are more likely to bodybuild and excessively lift weights. Uh, they're more likely to be concerned with thinning hair or going bald. Um, and interestingly, men with BDD are more likely to have a substance use problem, such as alcohol or other kinds of drugs. And they're also more likely to be single and living alone. And that could be a real problem because it means that men with BDD get caught in these peculiar loops about what would need to be in place in order to find a partner, but they're doing that very much on their own, figuring it out in their own heads. And anyone even that's only spent a bit of time in the wee small hours of the morning worrying about something can attest to the fact that if you're just going around around in circles in your own head, you do not get perspective, right? Things tend to get a bit more extreme or a bit more out of shape. Um, so BDD in men can be, can be very challenging. Just briefly mentioning, uh, again, the kind of the, the diagnostic criteria for um, muscle dysmorphia. Here, the idea is the individual is preoccupied with the idea that his or her body build is too small or insufficiently muscular. About 10% of people with muscle dysmorphia are women, by the way. Um, and this specifier is used even if the individual is preoccupied with other areas of the body, such as which is often the case. So it's rare that muscle dysmorphia is a standalone kind of BDD, but actually very few kinds of BDD are standalone kinds of BDD. Most people have more than one area of concern. Um, so, but to capture the idea of what muscle dysmorphia is about, it is about the idea of not being big enough, not being muscular enough, um, too skinny. By the way, if any, at any point a, a, a pertinent question pops up in your head, do stop me and ask. So this is the archetypical representation of, of muscle dysmorphia. Um, and obviously the media tended to rebrand or rename um, muscle dysmorphia as bigorexia. And I've, I just wondered for the, uh, what thoughts, again, were for people here, what your thoughts are about how useful that is. is it, do you think it's helpful because it's more, on a, more of an understandable term, or do you think it can kind of slightly uh, disguises the real issue of muscle dysmorphia? What are your thoughts? Right. So it's a bit too narrow. That's my instinctive reaction to it, and that's why I even get a bit itchy when people talk about being, having a bit of being a bit dysmorphic. Not really, the, you know, we talk about a major psychiatric condition here. Um, interestingly, there, there, the, the, the counterweight to that is that um, there are a lot of similarities and parallels between men who have muscle dysmorphia and men who have eating disorders. They're quite a, a similar population. They're in, in terms of educational attainment even and underlying thinking and so on. So, so there, is, you know, there is some relationship, but I would agree that we need to perhaps, and I'm, partly, I'm, I have to be honest with you, I'm partly thinking about where the charity should stand on this, about how much we should try and protect the term body dysmorphic disorder and things like muscle dysmorphia against people minimising and trivialising the problem. So, I was having a little look about thinking about uh, male body image concerns and that many men apparently are concerned about their genitals. So I was having a little look at some of the uh, various uh, so physical solutions that people have used to target their penis for enlargement. So we have suspensory ligament release, which means cutting the, the ligament that sort of props the penis up so it drops a little further forwards. Um, Pre-pubic li liposuction, which means taking the fat away from the area around the penis, so that by that means that the, effectively you know, your body steps back a bit, so your penis looks a little bit bigger. Penile disassembly and cartilage transplant, which sounds pretty nasty to me. Um, lipo injection, so injecting fat into the penis. Um, ingesting, uh, sliding uh, silico mesh into the penis. Uh, one of the more modern and uh, quite impressive looking results if you look at what's on the internet. <laughs> it's an interesting job being a psychologist in this area, I tell you. Um, dermal graft, uh, injecting of synthetic materials. Um, 
One of the things that's interesting about, again, working with people with BDD is that it's all very well saying to someone, you've got body dysmorphic disorder, therefore you, it's really unwise to have a cosmetic procedure because it doesn't treat your BDD, it's a physical treatment or a psychiatric treatment, blah, 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 blah. Which is right, but one of the interesting dilemmas about that is that sometimes people then literally will take matters into their own hands, which in context of this problem sounds slightly different than I... Than, but the... So including things like injecting, we've known quite a few people to try injecting Vaseline into their penis to enlarge it. It's not to be recommended. Vaseline's great for a lot of things, not for that. Um, but there are a lot, there's a lot on the internet about how men can try and improve and increase the size of their penis using exercise, exercises like jelking, which sounds a lot like it would sound if you were doing it. Vacuum pumps, which of course Austin Powers is very much famous for having, um, and other kinds of stretching devices. None of these actually seem to make any real difference. Um, in, in point of fact, penis enlargement is quite a difficult thing to do. Hi. One of the, um, th the in, so the, the the quite a lot of. Uh, plastic surgeons and dermatologists have adopted a voluntary screening process for BDD. Um, not a lot of them seem to do it very well. And of course, one of the dilemmas is that if you have BDD and you're hell-bent on getting cosmetic surgery anyway, you just answer the questions right. Um, re so the proper answer is to provide better treatment for BDD rather than less treatment from cosmetic surgeons, if you see what I mean. But um, we are... One of the things we're doing is forging better links with um, the associations for cosmetic and dermatological uh, surgeons to see what we can do to try and help to puzzle that dilemma out a bit better. So it is an important one because some of the most severe people with BDD you'll ever meet are the people that have had a cosmetic procedure and then feel that it, things are worse as a result of it and they, it's almost like it's their fault and the surgeon's fault for really screwing things up and then they feel even more hopeless and depressed, and that's, you know, it can be very, very, very problematic. Uh, I had a little look also on some of the cosmetic treatments for baldness. Um, there's a new drug on the market called Ruxolitinib, right? Never been a strong issue, um, which apparently is going to be the new miracle cure for baldness, but it's only been tested on about 30 people so far, so I wouldn't rush into it. Um, Propecia has been around for a long time. R Rogaine is the kind of topical treatment you rub in. Obviously, hair transplants um, have become increasingly popular. Using wigs, of course, is like more old fashioned strategy, and various kinds of shampoos with different potions and lotions and caffeines and kinds of things in them to try and either slow down your hair loss or to increase the idea to increase your um, hair growth. And the kinds of activities that people with muscle dysmorphia get into are you know, increase an excessive amount of time in the gym, getting really stressed out and irritable if they can't get to the gym, uh, often overtraining when injured, uh, very disordered eating, kind of, again, it is a bit like anorexics in the sense of if an anorexic ate a dozen eggs um, and a bunch of steak and a load of protein drinks a day, but was, was, was being super careful still to avoid anything they considered to be carbs or fattening foods. It's, it, that, in that sense, it is a little similar. Um, and other supplements such as creatine, which can be quite problematic in terms of overloading and overstressing uh, kidneys and things. Steroid abuse, again, the media get really excited about steroid abuse, but one of the reasons they get excited about it is that, in their minds, having a mental health problem only really counts sometimes if it really results in a physical illness. So it's, it kind of goes from being not so real to being real in the sense it somehow caused a physical harm. But I'm not trying to minimise the dangers of steroid use. It can, of course, cause heart attacks and... Uh, high blood pressure and is a risk factor for cancer and can cause relationship problems through rage and things like that. But I would still say that the most important part of having muscle dysmorphia is having muscle dysmorphia. Uh, because it is, as, all, as with all kinds of BDD, it can be very destructive in itself. Um, so you've got these other kinds of issues of distress if, if, um, if body parts are uh, exposed. Comparing, as always, um, 
and lots of distress and mood swings. But the, one of the things that really gives away someone who's become overly dependent on the gym is that other parts of their lives are being seriously neglected, that they're not seeing their friends, they're missing days from work, um, relationships are falling by the wayside because it, it, getting to the gym twice a day and eating seven times a day becomes far more important than, than socialising. This is a, uh, an interesting, if troubling, uh, development in uh, people who seem to have muscle dysmorphia or other kinds of uh, body-focused kind of muscle preoccupations uh, using a, an oil called synthol. And synthol was originally developed as a topical oil for bodybuilders to use just to kind of you know, do the circuit based thing, you know, shining yourself up uh, to bring up the definition. Um, I've no idea who discovered it, but some bright spark dis discovered that if you inject it directly into muscles, it can cause them to expand and increase in size. Um, but it can also lead to the most amazing tearing um, and infections and really significant muscle damage. Um, but the chap on the uh, right -hand side, top right-hand side here is a chap that refers to himself as Synthol Man. And there are a number of people on YouTube and on the internet who quite strongly promote the use of Synthol as a way of um, addressing the need to be bigger and more muscular. Um, and again, as I say, this is the dilemma that people, if, you don't, if, we, if we don't promote and increase decent treatments for, for BDD and muscle dysmorphia, Worryingly, people will do, uh, t do things themselves, sometimes with quite uh, disturbing results. So, one of the things that um, I think is well worth thinking about when you're considering how to approach and overcome any kind of BDD is to first of all try and figure out, well, why? What, why bother getting rid of BDD? It's tough. It, it's not the easiest problem in the world to change. Um, so, you know, as the actors might say, well, kind of, what's your motivation? And one of the things to get behind to help with that is to consider your valid directions. To consider what do you want to really be about as a person? What do you want to be remembered for? You know, when your, people are chatting about you at your funeral, what kind of things do you want them to say about you? And what do you want to be if on your deathbed? Do you want to look back and think, hmm, I kind of wish I'd spent a bit less time worrying about my appearance? Or do you want to look back and maybe have some other more interesting regrets, even? So it's worth thinking about, and I'd really encourage you just to take a moment. I mean, every time I look at this, I'm reminded of trying to put myself back on track a little bit. So. I just want to suggest to take a moment just to have a think about whether, and this would apply to the professionals as well as anyone who has BDD, as anyone who's a care or a supporter, um, just to take a moment to check in with yourself about whether you think you're on track in terms of being the kind of person you living consistently with being the kind of person you want to be in your career, in intimate and romantic relationships, in your parenting if you have children, in education if you're learning or teaching uh, with your friends in your social life, with your family, in your spiritual practice. That could be spiritual from the sense of listening to a beautiful piece of music through to being very committed to an orthodox kind of, uh, uh, you know, an organized religion. Um, whether you are in line with the kind of member of society you want to be and whether you're in line with taking care of your physical health in a, in a really wholesome and truly healthy way and whether you're in line with your hobbies, interests, and other kinds of recreational activities. <coughs> just, I just suggest, just take a moment. I bet you <laughs> there are some areas where you could do with nudging yourself online a little bit. Anything stand out? Anyone have a thought? Oh, God, I really need to get back on to right, and and you know that's a very very important part of life, and a very very commonly, of course, affected by BDD. And it, so it might be really important to think about how you put that front and centre in the, in the spirit of thinking about recovery from BDD is partly about reclaiming part of your life back, and you know, really recovering that. Any others? Thank you for sharing that. It's, it, remember, the, 
This is an important counterpoint because what we want to do is try and take BDD out of your driving seat and put you back in your driving seat. And to, to do that, sometimes you need to be quite clear on how you want to go forward. Um, I, th I think it was um, quite interesting when we were talking about earlier on uh, the idea of, and Charlotte was talking about, uh, the idea of growing out of, growing, growing away. Um, and I think these are the kinds of areas one might think about how to, how to invest in those areas. Related to that um, is also to think about as maybe you become more preoccupied and more uh, consumed by concerns about your appearance, um, what aspects of your personality have become a little neglected? Um, have you neglected your creativity? Have you neglected, I mean, it's interesting, very interesting to think about, again, Paul's focus on co developing compassion and has that become particularly underdeveloped as scrutinizing, criticizing, and so on have become more overdeveloped. Um, and it's just worth thinking about how you might try and pull one or two aspects of your personality to put them front and center as you battle through and try and overcome um, your BDD or muscle dysmorphia. So this is a very quick way of trying to conceptualize what BDD is all about, which is a problem of trying too hard. It's a problem, it's like trying to, like trying to dig your way out of a hole, um, avoiding and comparing and using rituals um, aimed at one is usually trying to prevent ridicule or rejection or humiliation. Uh, oftentimes it's aimed at trying to be a bit more certain about how you look, be a bit more sure. Often it's about trying to reduce and eliminate flaws, <clears throat> trying to look right and trying to get a sense of things feeling more, more just so and to feel more comfortable. But as, as you become more engaged in activities which focus your mind onto your appearance and oftentimes will consume other parts of your life, you find often that the solutions have become the problem. So what, to start to really make a difference here, clearly the kinds of things you need to do, start to think about what are you going to try and change? Are there key avoidance behaviours that you think you need to try and change? Are there particular compulsions that you need to change? Are there particular mental activities such as comparing or planning or thinking about how your appearance could be made better. And other parts of your life that you need to try and reclaim from the clutches of your BDD. And again, I would encourage you to take a minute or two even to think about what areas of avoidance need tackling. What compulsions need to be cut back and stopped. <coughs> and how you're going to try and refocus your mind to get away from certain mental activities. Because like any problem solving, Overcoming BDD is only ever as good as making sure you've defined the problem properly. <coughs> Again, I would invite, invite you all, if you, if you feel able to, to maybe if you, share an, an aspect of avoidance behaviour that you might consider. You could even think of today as making a commitment to starting to overcome that. What, you, what might you be avoiding now that you think okay, from today I'm going to try and start to confront those situations. Excellent. <laughs> Bravo on a, on, a, on a first step, well done. Avoiding social events. So again, another, and again, a kind of important step today. Okay, so really getting over that kind of just right kind of experience. Fighting back against that. And there is no time like the present. Now, your BDD has no interest in your well-being. Uh, it just wants to be around for as long as it possibly can. So, and every day that you allow yourself to willingly acquiesce to those avoidance behaviours and compulsions and mental activities, it's very understandable because standing up against it is very painful and difficult, but this is your life. You don't get it back. And I really would hope that um, some of you would think about seeing today as an opportunity to really put your foot down, put a line in the sand and, and fight back. This is a, um, a cafe called the Upside Down Cafe. Um, I'm kind of curious to go there now, actually. It, 
it's uh, everything in there is upside down, apparently. And, and I bring you this image just as by way of bringing to life the suggestion that one of the best ways in which you're going to do this is to turn your BDD on its head, one of the best ways you're going to recover, is to try and think about what you're avoiding and start to think about how you're going to start to approach it. Think about what you're doing excessively in terms of it could be checking, it could be reassurance seeking, it could be researching products, um, it could be researching supplements, it could be uh, engaging in various camouflaging behaviours, and try and think about how you're going to start to systematically cut those down and stop them. Think about what it is you tend to cover up and conceal and avoid being seen by others, and think about how you're going to start to gently reveal those. Importantly, think about how important it is to spend less time thinking about your appearance in order to regain that perspective. Overthinking and thinking is, is, overthinking is a big part of the problem in virtually every psychiatric problem. Um, BDD particularly is a preoccupation problem. So no amount of time spent de more debating, more thinking, more trying to puzzle it out, even if it's seemingly sensible conversations, it's very unlikely that that's going to help get more perspective. Because if you're overthinking, that's the problem. It needs to, of course, be less thinking. Consider about how might, how might it be important to refocus your attention away from your appearance in order to feel good about how you look. One of the important dimensions of BDD is an ex that people with BDD, we think, with, with the evidence seems to suggest, that people with BDD and muscle dysmorphia have a very highly developed ability to scope out detail. So if, you, if, you, if you're looking at your appearance, you will tend to see flaws better than the average person. Which means you probably do need to think about how you might... It's worth thinking about that, because you might be about think about how you dial down your level of scrutinising. But also, we know that people with BDD aren't very good at taking the overall impression in. So they've got highly developed detail and slightly underdeveloped ability to step back and take an overall impression of something. And that's been true of studies where people have asked people to draw out pictures of houses, and, and indeed through in studies where people have been asked to draw out pictures of bodies and their faces and so on. People with BDD are very good at detail, quite poor um, overall pictures. So when you're trying to tackle, be it the, the, the V-shapedness of your uh, body or the muscles on your arms or the a uh, bald spot on your head or the size of your penis, something to try and think is to stop zeroing in onto the details and to try and take a much broader picture and try and take in your overall appearance um, instead. But also to try and think about that in an even broader perspective of thinking about how you exist in the world and redirecting your attention into other aspects of yourself and other aspects of the world around you so that your brain can have a bit of a rest from thinking about your appearance and in doing so, heal and recover and be able to come back at your appearance with a much greater level of objectivity. It is amazing how many times when, when you've got someone's preoccupation down and they're not spending that much time every day thinking about their appearance and scrutinising their appearance in different ways, how often they'll say, yeah, I know, I, I'm not so bad. They've just shifted this kind of much more overall impression and it's less scrutinised, less tight. Um, and it's really important to understand that if you're going to overcome BDD, that don't focus on trying to do things which are going to make you feel better about your appearance because that's just going to refocus your attention on your appearance. Try and do things which refocus your attention to other things and focus on reducing the impact of your BDD on your life. Focus on reclaiming your life. Focus on reducing your distress by facing up to the things you're afraid of, for example, uh, reactivating yourself to improve your mood, cutting back on compulsions, to treat the BDD, and then watch your self-concept and body image improve as, a, as an output of that. Because the thoughts of being ugly and defective and disgusting are a consequence of BDD, of so much preoccupation, so much distress, um, so much over-focusing. Um, and when those things stop, then you'll find that your ability to appraise your appearance better will come almost naturally. 
Because the tendency, of course, is when you're talking to a friend or a family member, they'll just try really hard to make you feel better about how you look. But that's at the tip of the iceberg, and it won't help you to address the avoidance behaviours, the compulsions, and all the other aspects of your life that are being affected by your breathing. It won't affect your excessive amount of attention and scrutinising on your appearance. So those things need to change so that your ability for your brain to process your appearance can cool down, can get healthy, and become more objective. What do people think about what I'm saying there? Because for me, that's... If, if, it, if there is a sort of BDD magic bullet, that understanding that is part of it. In terms of um, sort of not checking the reassurance, yes. what is the alternative to that if you want to sort of just cut it out? Or... Well, as, oh, as an alternative to not seeking reassurance? Yeah. Well, partly it's not seeking reassurance. <laughs> but there is a, that, although that being said, there is a bit of data. Um, and one of the dilemmas about working with body dysmorphic disorder is we're tending to have to borrow and steal from other similar problems like OCD and uh, social phobia. And there's a little bit of data in the area of reassurance seeking with OCD where if you do something alternative like, and it fits very nicely with what Paul was talking about, the need for that um, affiliative system and soothing system to come in, so sometimes shifting from asking for reassurance into something like getting a hug can make a significant difference. Because right. you're soothing down the system, but you're not refocusing your attention on your appearance. That he works really hard to stop asking. <laughs> because it's, it's near impossible. We, so we used to do this. We used to say to people, friends, family members, and partners, and so on, hospital says I cannot answer such questions to which the patient would usually just persist really, 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 really hard until you gave up. Or get really pissed off and there'd be other rows and, um, you know, it, it, the emphasis has to come from the person with BDD to work on not asking. You can try and redirect the conversation and you can try and give a hug instead of, ask, uh, but it's, instead of answering the questions, but it's, it's going to only really work when the person who has the problem is, is on a kind of on different message, if you like. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Any other questions or doubts or reservations about what I've said so far? Uh, yeah, I think, I think it's, it's important. We know that people uh, with BTD are better at recognising upside-down faces, for example. Um, they're, they're, I, I've, I'm really interested in doing a, a piece of research on the ability to recognise varying shades in colours, which is, it seems... Uh, to be much, much, much better in people with BDD than, than the average person on the street. And we do need to learn a bit more about what exactly are the, are the really good ways of helping people to counterweight for that. Um, certainly not overthinking and putting that system under even more stress and strain if it's already a bit sensitive is really going to be important. In a way, if you have that high-performance visual processing system, you need BDD even less than the average person on the street does. And it might be that that's why you have to be, you know, be a bit more careful about not scrutinising and reassurance seeking in some ways. <coughs> but it's an, it's an area I'd like to know a bit more about. Another thing I'm very keen on is the idea of trying to find some kind of metaphor that you can use to help uh, think about your BDD. Um, and in particular, <laughs> a favourite for a lot of people is to try and think of BDD as a kind of bully. And if you want a bully to stop bullying you, what have you got to do? Ignore it. Ignore it. Stand up to it, maybe? Refuse to be pushed around by it? And so that's just one way of trying to think. Because if you keep giving in to a bully, it'll keep coming back at you. And it's just one way of trying to think about um, standing up to BDD. Uh, and a lot of people find it helpful to consider. And again, you can think about how... Um, Professor Gilbert's work might fit into this in the sense of the, the inner critic yeah, and having to sort of stand up to that. Um, finding some way of changing your relationship, changing your perspective on those, uh, on those ongoing um, critical thoughts. Um, and if you want to learn some more, I cannot recommend... When, who here hasn't read The Broken Mirror? <coughs> Who hasn't? Get The Broken Mirror, it's great. I mean, it, it, is, it is Catherine Phillips' book is just 
People that read it agree with me? Really helpful? Um, anyone from a healthcare professional to someone who's had BDD for Yonks should read The Broken Mirror because it's such a great grounding guide and, and really reinforces understanding of the nature of the problem. Catherine just writes about it brilliantly. Um, uh, a book that she's involved in called The Adonis Complex focuses much more on these male issues within BDD and of course um, the book that I was involved in with David Veal and Alex Clark um, gives our take on a CBT perspective of how to overcome um, BDD but if you can help yourself to understand the problem well you've, you've got a very good start because you can start to redefine the problem in its psychological terms and then you can start to use psychological behavioural solutions so understanding is, is key. That's, I'm aware we've, we've got a kind of quite a lot to catch up on today. Is, that's as much as I wanted to say today. Are there any other questions or thoughts from the things I've covered? I'm personally not optimistic. Um, I think we could try, um, but people have been pointing the finger at Facebook, uh, not Facebook, no, what's the thing where you changed the Photoshop? People have been pointing the finger at Photoshop for yonks, and they've been pointing the finger at uh, 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 people behind uh, campaigns against anorexia have been pointing the finger at media images for yonks as well. It hasn't changed very much in the 20 years that I've been involved um, in this. I, I mean, I think we should try, but I also think we should try to make sure, make sure that people understand that body image problems are really common can be really damaging and really severe, and that there are things you can do to overcome body image problems in spite of the fact that the media is a bit crazy. I mean, a lot of Americans did vote, vote for Donald Trump, but a good number didn't. I mean, we're not that influenceable. We still have the capacity sometimes to choose to do the right thing. I hope, post-Brexit. Um, <clears throat> so I think, as a, again, as a foundation, I think we should try, but I think our, uh, my view is that our emphasis should be on raising awareness of the condition, raising awareness, and be really putting pressure on people to provide good treatments. But anyone wants to do a campaign to stop the media from putting out stupid images, please don't, don't let me stop you. <laughs> All right. Any other questions or thoughts at this point? Uh, to think of any psychiatric problems as being truly separate is to misunderstand the nature of psychiatric problems because they're invented by committees, di different diagnostic categories. And it's not like we have it with different kinds of cancer where you can see a cell under a microscope and it's definitely, you know, that, diff that is definitely different than that. Or that, you know, uh, a cold is clearly different than flu. We're not in that territory. So it's never right to say that they're, they're going to be different. They may well be, they may well be overlapping. And if, it, it, particularly as a person, the, so we know that what happens is the more people you see, the more diagnoses you're likely to um, collect. Which is, therapists and clinicians and doctors and psychiatrists try to help by saying, oh, we know what that is. You're not the only one with that. We call it blah, blah, blah. <laughs> Which is, you see, the intention's good, but what can come out is, it, uh, by the end of, you know, Seeing two or three different kinds of therapists and counsellors, you get like a shopping list of different problems. You don't know what the blazes is going on. So I would say choose the definition that fits and makes most sense to you. Um, if it feels like, you know what, I am dependent on exercise, but I'm dependent on it because I see it as being, it's about how to regulate my body shape in some way, or it's about uh, feeling stronger so that people can't take the piss out of me or whatever, then probably it's more in the kind of BDD department. Um, and addictions oftentimes aren't that straightforward period. Like, you know, a lot of people who use alcohol are using it partly because they're covering up social anxiety. So think about it in terms of the function it has for you and don't worry too much about the definition of the different, different um, sort of psychiatric or classifications. Because at the end of the day, the most important thing is to kind of get a grip on you, your values, how you want to live, and make sure that those are your guiding lights rather than any, because you want to, the broad principle being follow the plan, the plan of how you want to live, rather than following how you feel. And trying to use that to drag, so in either case, that's probably going to speak to whatever they call it. There'll be a version of exercising that you would probably want for yourself, and try and follow that. Does that make sense? And again, I think that, that would fit very nicely with one of the things that, again, Paul Gilbert was saying, which is about this isn't your fault. 
you know, we're all given a human brain, and then we've got to figure out what to do with it and how to get the best out of it. And some human brains really don't need problems like BDD um, and really need more TLC in a kinder hand. All right, I guess we could stop now, give you guys a break. It's been a busy morning already. Thank you very much for your attention. <laughs>